Aloha, stewards of the land, humanitarians, and solutionists. Welcome to another episode of A Dose of Positivity, where I have the privilege and the honor to interview these passionate change makers, thought leaders, social and environmental innovators, and wellness professionals. Yes. And the topic for our show today is one thread at a time. We make a dis- difference. And my special guest is Cook, Crispina French. And she is going to blow your socks off and, and yes, has so much to share with you guys. So just hold tight. But before we get started and while people are coming into the call, I want to remind everybody that this is a live broadcast. We do appreciate your comments and your chats in the, in the chat area. And we will get to each and every one of them if possible on this call, or we will make note of it in our YouTube or podcast channels, which we put our replay, our replays up every week and we'll make sure you have that link in the chat right now if you want to go back and listen to some of our other past issues you'll find our youtube and podcast stations in the chat and then again for a reminder for daily dose of positivity please join us in our facebook group again we'll put that in the chat and it will be also in the replay section of the youtube and podcast areas and if you wish to receive daily doses of positivity or weekly beautiful messages from us where we promote not just things to sell for you to sell for us to sell to you but things to help you get healthy help you find your place in the world and enjoy being human in this incredible time that we are living in um we never spam your inbox so it's just a real pleasure everybody says that's such a pleasure to hear from you so don't be shy putting your email um giving us your email and i just want to say that um it is an incredible day here on the big island and a lot of people say to me i don't know if i could live there you guys don't really have the seasons well i want to show everybody that this is pineapple season right now we are in pineapples and the best pineapples you ever want to eat so you all come visit us at our retreat here at always in season farmstead and we'll put that link in the chat as well and before we get going while people keep coming into the room i'm going to read as usual um, from one of my books this one is from uh reading is from living like the future matters the evolution of a soul to soul entrepreneur and our special guest crispina french is an eco bohemian soul to soul entrepreneur who's done incredible things i can't wait to introduce you so before I got into business. This is in my chapter called um, Blooming. Um, and it's about business because we're going to be talking a lot about somewhat about business today. Before I got into business, I thought that money was the root of all evil. My new mindset was not to let money define who I was and to not let my net worth outweigh my self worth i constantly reminded myself that money is merely a social cultural construct and it was the intention that i gave to that money that mattered i was in control of my relationship with prosperity and what it meant to my identity When I started to make more money than I ever imagined, I realized it had the power to both empower and create or the power to disempower and destroy. A make money mindset was more effective when I was grateful and I shared the wealth when I empowered and created. Making more money meant business was good. It meant that I provided a service that people appreciated and I created opportunities for people to work in an environment that fostered good intentions. It felt good to donate money to causes. I believed in and to lend money to others. To build true wealth means to put meant to put my money into helping others and to heal 
the earth. All these reasons made money meaningful. Why not make some? My power lay in not letting money rob my soul, yet it, but in cultivating those good intent tensions. But no matter how much money I made, I continue to shop and still do at thrift stores. I still buy used cars, furniture, and just about everything else. It's not because I'm cheap. It's out of principle. Why rob finite resources of our beautiful Mother Earth when the landfills are overflowing with perfectly good things? Money matters. It put food, puts food on our table, clothes on our backs, and roofs over our heads. Without it, our most basic needs are threatened. I am reminded that paper money is just simply made from cotton and linen, and that coins are from metal and minerals. Food from the soil and the sea, clothes from plants and animals, and homes from various materials come all from the Mother Earth. It matters more now than ever how we spend it. Whoa, thank you for soaking in those words. And now, without further ado, I am so excited to, to introduce you to Crispina French, who is a kindred spirit, a soul sister, and an environmental optimist. She happens to be a textile alchemist and she upcycles everything that has to do with fiber one thread at a time. She takes discarded clothing and manufactured waste since her college days in the 80s. It all started as she was working her way through art school out of her need to make money around her other two jobs and full-time class schedule and her love of making with her hands. Ragamuffins, which you can see behind her, got her through school and set her on her magical path of self-employment that has carried her through life, building awareness of our textile waste problems without blame, anxiety, or panic, promoting environmental support that nurtures us humans too, while inspiring others to wrap their heads around the, effect, the effects of their consumption, but more the effects of the positive actions are that things that can rock our world and her world too. And Crispina goes and she's teaching people now how to do this. Okay. And we'll get more into that, but this is the best part. And I know I'm going a little long here on this bio, but I never had anybody give me a bio like this. So I got to share this with you guys because it is so fun. Sit back, take this in. This woman has collaborated with Patagonia in 1995 on her pioneering mission um, through waste recovery projects. She's planted trees in British Columbia. Columbia. She was awarded an SBA Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 1996. She ate ice cream with Ben and Jerry's and and she also ran a recycle manufacturing company for 22 years, supplying 350 stores around the world. She's been kissed on the cheek by Carly Simon. If you don't know who Carly Simon is, I'm dating you people, who owns and loves her blankets. She sold a sweater to David Matthews. Holy shit, excuse me, people. She even milked a goat. She waited on Steven Taylor and Robert Parrish. And she collaborated with Ellen Fisher's design team, developing a renew and resulting green Ellen model in Tiny Factory. I'm gonna go through a few of these other ones. Oh my gosh, she rode the Greyhound bus coast to coast. She took the train across Canada. She walked across a van at night with her darling son with a piggy bank. And she seen Steven, Stevie Wonder play Superstition while dancing on his piano bench. She's actually employed 40 people at the age of 23. You and I are so, we have so much in common. Anyway, on and on here, you guys, we're gonna put her bio in our Facebook group because 
Um, and actually, Kel, put this part of the bio in the chat for people to have because it is so great. But one of the best things um, is that she loves her family and her friends and she lives the dream, people. And she wants you to know that you can too. And that is why Crispina French is on our show. This is a massive dose of positivity. Welcome to the show, Crispina. And please come on and tell us, how did you find your way to this, doing all this? <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Diana. That was such a nice, in, like, enter, like, your entrance. Here you are. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Crispina French, and I live in Beckett, Massachusetts, where I am actually right now in my studio. And like Donna said, I am actually living the dream, and I love it. Um, so I guess the your question was like, how did I get here? First of all, I am a, a strong believer in that the universe provides, right? Like when we need stuff, and if we just like surrender, um, which is kind of what does that mean to surrender? Just let whatever's going to happen, happen and magic will come in your path. And it's crazy. And sometimes there's, um, you know, some hiccups that come along with the, with the blessings. So, um, but back in 1985, I had, um, I was at art school in Boston and I was um, going to mass art, which, um, and I was paying my way through school because that's just the way that my family structured our lives, which at the time I was a little resentful to my parents. I was right out of high school going to college and, um, they were like, yeah, go, go for it, have fun. And you know, you'll figure it out. And, um, it really actually, I, I would not be where I am today had that situation been different. So, um, my parents were both artists and they never, it wasn't because I was at art school that they weren't willing to pay. It was, um, just because they thought that if you want something, you need to work for it. And I thought, uh, okay, I'm going to tr try this out. So um, I never was told no. I was never told that I couldn't do something. And I think that my parents, um, because they were artists and because they had this creative, um, they were predisposed to be being creative thinkers. Um, they both taught in a public high school. So they had their art ca careers that kind of fit around their school teaching careers. Um, and because they were teachers, we wound up with the ability to travel in the summertime when they were on vacation we had you know the same schedules as our parents when we were in kids in school so i was kind of exposed to a lot of travel and uh, different cultures and different languages as a pretty young person and because i was never told that i couldn't do stuff i just knew that i could um and i think that that's the biggest gift we can give our children is to don't tell them they can't do things. I mean, it's, you know, it, even if it's improbable, you don't have to tell them that because if they don't know, they, they won't know. And they'll be able to um, follow their dreams in a way that they might not, um, if they're limited in their ability to dream, right? So fast forward 56 years, here I am. Um, I started my business, like I said, in um, for reals, like I started a business that I knew was a business in 1989. And um, two years after I graduated college, I had 40 employees, like Donna said, um, never took a business class in my life and was recycling um, thrift store clothing. Mainly, initially, it was because it was accessible and it was, you know, I, I didn't have any money and I was trying to figure out how to make money. And I, my, I was actually the very, let me show you what these little guys are. These are, these are called ragamuffins and made from recycled wool sweaters. And these are recent. I, I still make them on occasion. Although I have to say that my hands are a little tired of stitching through many layers of fabric by hand, but, um, I started making them out of handmade felt and, um, I was visiting my parents one weekend and my dad said, you know, I was explaining the process about making felt and I, I, I'm really cold. Like I get very cold in the winter time and in Massachusetts, it's, it's, you know, dank and damp and cold and wet. And the felting process is all of those things as well. And mass art was in these kind of dingy old buildings at the time. And I didn't like the process. I didn't like being wet up to my elbows in February making felt. It was just like not my thing at all, but I loved the fabric, the texture that I was able to achieve. And my dad took one look at it and he goes, 
you could probably get that same texture if they were made out of shrunk wool sweaters. And I was like, you are a genius. Let's go to the Goodwill right now. Let's go. Drive me. <laughs> and um, my dad was also Irish, so I can impersonate what he actually said to me. Like, oh, you could get the texture from a shrunk wool <laughs> sweaters now, don't you know? <laughs> he didn't really like that, but... <laughs> That's so great. So, he was awesome. My dad was like one of my, my big, he, I was maybe his biggest fan and he was probably mine. Um, anyway, so that's, that's what started me using recycled wool sweaters initially to create this product. And it was funny because right around that time, I was really concerned about the environment. This was 1983 when I first started, right? I graduated high school in 1983. And when I first started being really concerned about the environment was in Massachusetts, they were passing something called the bottle bill. And that was to, you know, take your cans and bottles back for the five cent deposit. Right. And, and I just started thinking like biodegradable, like, what does that mean? Like it was new, it was all new. Like this was not conversation that anybody like was, it was not commonplace. Recycle wasn't even like, nobody really knew what that meant. So fast forward a couple of years, cause I could talk forever. Um, People thought it was crazy when I was making stuffed toys out of recycled sweaters. They thought they were dirty. They weren't sure, like, am I supposed to put that with my kid? Is that like, is it okay? Like, it, it, they just didn't know. And I had waited tables for years um, by the time I did my first like show. And I knew that I like to play a game with myself. And actually, Donna, what you read was so like, just perfect because <laughs> I had, I had waited tables and the waiting tables I love. And you know, most people who waited tables like can't wait to figure out what they really wanna do. And I just, it was something that I so enjoyed because it was a game. I could go into a restaurant and work in a, you know, I try to get jobs in like high-end restaurants where people are gonna spend a lot of money and leave me tips, right? And I would, my goal was to find the most miserable people in that restaurant and have them enjoy themselves have them enjoy like teach figure out what these people need and give it to them for an hour or two whatever that meal time was right and I was really good at it I yeah. you know, people would come to me they'd be like table 22 cheers they're miserable and I'd be like awesome okay and you know when people can change their mindset in a period of an hour and a half they love you they love you they might have actually changed their lives at dinner yeah. They might, and it might have only been the hour and a half, but there could be another hour and a half. Maybe there was a whole different way of seeing things. And it was just this magical opportunity that I was able to take with these people. And when people started questioning the, the kind of credence and the, the, the ethics or the, 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 is it okay? Is it okay? Can I, can I buy that? Like, really? My response was the same how can I educate these people? How can I turn these people around into thinking that this is the flip and coolest thing they've ever seen? And oh my God, you're right. We got to start thinking about what we're giving away to the Goodwill. Shrunk wool sweaters, you guys, nobody's going to wear them. They're shrunk. That's why they gave them to the Goodwill. They, they don't fit. They're, they're stiff. They're not comfortable. Like they're going in the garbage, right? Unless I can harvest them and make them into these toys. So that is sort of what my whole life has been focused on you guys i learned it waiting tables and i'm not even kidding like and you can you can use it in any place in your business any place in your life no matter what if, like we all run into people who are maybe just having a hard day right and if you can plant a seed a glimmer of joy if it's five minutes if it's you know they're experiencing grief they're having a t you know something ha has been really hard for them if you can give them that seed, that little flame of candle here, this is for you. They can, it might only be that, that 30 second interval that you interact with them, but it's, it broke something down, right? It, it broke the negativity into something that's a possibility, right? It's offering a possibility. Um, so now, um, you know, I ran my, my production company making ragamuffins. I made ragamuffins for a company called the nature company. If anybody's, I'm dating myself right now. Cause the nature company I think is long gone, but they had, um, they were like a mall store back in like the late eighties, early nineties. And they had, I remember, do you remember like science? I've seen your, I've seen your dolls there. 
Yeah. yeah. Did you really? So we yeah. made literally we made thousands of dolls for them, and we saw. And you know, I've I've I sold to stores all literally like Donna said all over the world, and after um, about well. So I have three children, and my, when my son was little, I was a single mom, and it was me and him, and I just brought him with me. I was doing trade shows, 12 trade shows a year, all around the country, uh, you know, in Europe, and we just traveled together. And then um, many years later, I got married, had two more kids, my daughters two are younger, and I just looked at them one day, and I thought, you know what? I've had this adventure and it was awesome and manageable. And now I am outnumbered by small people. Like yeah. <laughs> I gotta do something different. So I took the opportunity to really pivot and it was um, it was hard decision to make because I had this amazing staff that I loved working with and I had to change my business to meet my needs. And I had been really used to meeting everybody around me's needs first. And one day my dad said to me, what are you making in the studio today, Crispina? And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I'm making phone calls and emails. And at that moment, it was like, I don't, I don't really want to. I don't want to write emails and make phone calls. I want to actually make things, right? I want to inspire people with um, my skill so that they can develop their skill. Um, and I learned that it's really easy to do that by having all those beautiful employees. You know, I taught people to, so I had 40 employees, 25 of them worked in their homes and they were deemed unemployable. Like I'm not kidding. That's the word they used unemployable by the state where they lived. And we were initially, I was in New York state and then I, I moved to Massachusetts. Um, and I moved to Massachusetts because I employed these people in their homes and that's um, not it's not really kosher in New York or it wasn't at the time it might be different now so I moved to Massachusetts where it is uh, it was legal at the time so these women who oftentimes were their you know single parents little kids elderly parents whatever they didn't have cars many of them didn't have cars were suddenly able to earn a living and yeah. do something creative and can we talk about blossoming, Donna, the chapter of your book that you shared? These yeah. women went from feeling like they were a burden to everything around them, right. started to blossom. And right. I, I, it, it makes me teary to think about yeah. people. Like I had one woman who came to work for me. She had four kids and she was, she, they always came in families, right? So she had, her mom was working for me, home sewers. She came to work for me as a home sewer. She didn't have any teeth. She had four young children. She was smart and she was a really good sewer. And over time she came to work, her kids got into, you know, the youngest one went off to kindergarten. So now she had time during the day. She came to work in the studio. She got her teeth fixed. I ran into her mm, probably six months ago. She went to college. She's now a nurse. Her, she's grandmother. She looks like a completely different person. Okay. And it was just that belief in having her know that she could, right? Like all I had to do was give her, all I had to do was ask her to serve me, <laughs> really. Yeah, right, you know? back to the restaurant. Dignity, right. building dignity. Dignity, dignity. So, um, and there's, that's, that's just a, uh, an example. And we were talking before we got started with uh, Donna and I were chatting a minute and I, and I live in a place where I grew up and I live in a place where I had my business. So I have a lot of shared history with people in my community. And it's, there's something really beautiful about knowing the transitions that people see, that seeing the transitions that people make in their lives and just celebrating the distance, right? Celebrating when people catch that spark and go, Oh yeah, I could do that. And there's nothing more beautiful to me, right? And then when people have their basic dignity, their basic um, self appreciation and, and, and pride, then they can start thinking about the environment. Then they can start being conscientious about how they spend their money. But before they have that, it's hard for them because they're just focusing on how they're gonna feed their kids, how they're gonna get to their doctor's appointment, how they're gonna, figure out how to, you know, I've got to go to a parent teacher conference and I don't have teeth. I can't make eye contact. I can't smile. Right. Like, right. So 
that is one of the beauties of creating textile upcycling business is that it's very, very accessible to people who don't have money. So now I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of, I wrote a teaching book in 2009, which I think you guys can see it up there. It's called the Sweater Chop Shop. And it's actually out of print, regrettably, right now. I'm working on the second edition, but you know, for me, like I've got so many irons in the fire. I don't know when it'll be ready, but um, you can find it used. It's called the Sweater Chop Shop. It's a great book if you're interested in developing a really inexpensive, super accessible craft. Lots of fun ideas in there for adults and kids. And that kind of led me down the path of teaching and coaching. And now, um, this year, 2020, what, or 2022, I hosted something called the textile, um, it was called Rags to Riches, the Textile Upcycling Summit. And it was three days of leaders in textile upcycling from all across the world, came together virtually um, to share their story and to share their magic and to share their expertise and experience with people who are, you know, interested in, in that aspect of our lives, you know, um, we are wrapped in textiles from the day we were born until the day we die. And it's so important. It's like, is it, to me, it's as important as the food we eat. I, lo I love that. I just want to just jump in here because you have just given it so many nuggets. My mind, my, my, so I'm just going to backtrack just a little bit because, sure, yeah. um, I, I, the, you know, when the part where you were talking about hiring these people and just the tears that come to your, the emotional, that feeling that you have around giving, helping people find dignity, giving them an opportunity. So beautiful. I mean, the parallels you and I have from, from the restaurant to having the same amount of employees, 40 plus employees at the same age and, and, and such, so much co commonality. And one of the things that I think that what that I found too exactly challenging is how can you expect someone to care about the environment when they don't have teeth in their mouth or they can't feed their kids or whatever. And now that we knowing that being an entrepreneur, especially an eco and entrepreneur, knowing that part of our service to the world is giving people opportunities to work in a company that cares about people and the planet and they care about you as an employee. I mean, that is just so, so we're both you and I, I mean, I, that's where you and I just connected so deeply. Now, I would love for you just to to backtrack in that story, like your relationship or understanding, you, you, you and I talked about you took um, some environmental courses and you also were taking these art classes and then you realized how detrimental the um, textile business was to the environment and um just the fact that you just said we're born we're wrapped in textiles and then when we when we die we're wrapped in textiles i mean boy what what a vision people is that um and how true that is and how we just take it for granted right so i'd love for you to do a little bit of a deep dive for a few minutes about your that whole environmental impact statement that um, your company took, I mean, and why the Nature Conservancy decided to have you make these dolls for 350 stores globally. Yeah, um, yeah. It's funny because it was like, yeah, so so text, the textile industry, just to start with, is the second most polluting industry after oil and gas. And a lot of the textile industry is actually supported by the oil and gas industry because polyester, all the you know synthetic fibers that we are wrapped in are made out of fossil fuel. So 65% um, of the new fabric made today is polyester. So it's oil and gas, um, and it's dirty, and it's not good for you. It's not good to wear. It's not good to wash. It's just generally bad for you. Um, a lot of people don't know that, and it's like organic food. Like, yes, it's great if you can afford organic and it's available to you, fantastic. And, you know, a lot of us don't have the means or the knowledge to consciously consume textiles that are not bad for us. So I've kind of taken, I'm like a one woman, actually, I'm not, I think I'm actually part of a, a pretty big movement at this point um, of people who are just compassionately educating with, um, there's no doom and gloom involved, right? Like those statistics I just shared with you are not things that I normally start my conversation with because it can become 
stymieing. It's overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, what can I possibly do, right? Well, the cool thing about us all being wrapped in textiles for our entire, um, tra you know, our, our, our trip around this planet as we live, um, is that we all have the power to actually do something, right? And like Donna um, started with saying how she shops at thrift stores to this day. It's not necessarily, she's not cheap. It's, it's a matter of awareness and why we don't need to create new when we've already got, right? We have so much. There's this abundance that we can tap into that many of us don't even see, right? So it's, it's actually right in front of us. So rather than feeling the need to, to, to be a consumer, which is actually kind of a funny term that they call all of us, like we are not consumer. citizens any longer. <laughs> we are consumers. Oh. But, uh, Let's let's turn that around and let's be citizens again. Um, so my whole um, thought about the textile industry and the pollution involved with that is, well, it's not necessarily just the pollution, but there's a lot of, you know, mo every single piece of clothing that anybody wears is made by people with hands. They're not machine made. People have this misconception that there's like factories in China that are cranking out pieces of clothing that are not constructed with people's hands. There's sewing machines with mainly women sitting at them doing the same four inch seam, you know, 7,000 times a week or a day or whatever it is, making very little money. And most of the people in that position in our textile industry are women and they're mostly brown women and they're mostly mistreated. So when you can buy a pair of pants at Target or whatever cheap store you want to, I'm not calling Target out specifically, but Target and Walmart, Sorry. wherever, you know, if your clothing is brand All new. All them out. Yeah. If it's brand new and it's cheap, you can rest assured that whoever made it was mistreated. So um, thrift store shop. That's my advice. Go to the thrift store. It's so much fun. It's so creative. You can find treasures, right? And every single time you purchase something in that in the from the thrift stream, this is kind of jargon. Um, you're taking it out of the landfill stream. You know, if you find something that oh, you know, I love that blouse or the blouse I'm wearing is actually like it's huge on me, but it's like such a nice, cool thing to wear on a very hot day like today. And if you find something that's you know maybe doesn't fit you quite right cut it up make it into something different put it you right know, on the sleeve off make it get creative it's very inexpensive it's a great way to kind of experiment and express yourself in a creative way um, and to present yourself in a way that really speaks to who you are and your authentic presence in the world right did i answer your question you, yeah 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 no you okay. totally you totally did you gave people reasons why that i mean just being thinking that i always thought of food and um the agro the industrial food complex and the industrial textile complex which are both run by the fossil fuel industry um it, it's all tied into this one big um mess of turning citizens into consumers and i think you answered that question really well and i you know one bite at a time one thread at a time one choice at a time we make a difference and you know, when you're shopping too at a, a thrift store, and I, I love that, I mean, that's my favorite pastime thing to do. And actually it helped me, this is a really interesting thing you guys, uh, you don't know about me, but you know, I, I've had a serious of food addiction, especially sugar um, throughout my life battle food addiction. And the best way for me to like, if I wanted like a box of Oreos or something back then, whatever it was, I would go to the thrift store. And I would buy, I would go on a binge buy and give all, most of it away. But it was just like that feeding ourselves or nurturing ourselves. And then not only am I feeding and I nurturing myself, I'm not eating those Oreos or whatever it is. I am then turning around and giving stuff away. And it just becomes a different kind of up cycle, right? And up consciousness. And I love somebody, Alan, who wrote in here, he says like, you're just like the epitome of love and a shining light. And that's what we need to exclude um, is that the, the negativity and include more of this conscious love and light and just the, just the word upcycle, up love, up level, up yeah, level yeah. Who is, uh, everything that we are and, and, and that abundance, like even just me in the thrift store coming out with two big bags of whatever it was, that the abundance. So I'd love to, let's talk about 
a new strategy for what abundance means instead of greed and um, the, the, the crimes against humanity that that greed creates all the way down to those little seven inch seams that some woman is doing 7,000 times a day. Let's talk about what is abundance and what does that, how, how's the stereotype of what is abundant that society has put on us created this sick society and how we can create a new mindset of abundance. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. I have um, I have a membership organization. It's called Stitcherhood, and it's for textile upcyclers, mainly our entrepreneurial textile Love upcyclers. It. Stitcherhood. And, yeah, it's awesome, and you guys can check it out. And I, I don't I don't mean to like pitch it right now, but if you want, you know, you look for it. anyway, you'll find is it, it on your is it on your website? We'll put it in the chat. Stitcherhood. I love yeah. that. Whoa! It's, yeah, you it's, are so creative and an entrepreneur and a wordsmith. So go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. Um, so Stitcherhood is um, this organization, and I met this woman. You know, I don't. I, I try to. I, I shy away from social media because I am. Um, I have ADD, and if I get on social media and I'm not being really careful, I will be gone for hours, and I'll be looking at things that really just don't matter to me, or I'll be filling mm -hmm. my head with like world news that makes me really sad. So. I have um, very limited times that I, I allow myself 20 minutes a day to respond to people who have reached out to me because I feel like that's really important for me personally to do and not to ask my assistant to do for me. So um, I was responding to a message I got from a woman one day and this, this thing popped up. It was like a video and it was this girl who has a thrift store full of fabric and I thought, what? Like, what is that? Like, I want to know more. So I clicked on it and I was like, oh gosh, like, where am I going? Am I going to be looking at pictures of my kindergarten crushes, grandkids or what? You know, like, and no, I just, I clicked on this and I just sent this woman, Catherine, a message. And I said, I want to learn more about your business. Well, lo and behold, Catherine, like, you know, this is like uh, Instagram. It could have been like, she could have been in Hong Kong, right? No, she's an hour up the road from me here in Massachusetts. We've become fast friends and she has the abundance mindset that is such a beautiful thing to observe so she, what she does and it's it's such a great service for me to access as well um i'm gonna back up a minute people okay. often will offer me donations of their old clothing because they know that i recycle old clothing and more often than not it's not really what i'm looking for i have a very small studio i don't do a lot of production anymore you know, thanks so much for thinking of me to give me all your grandma's beautiful wool blankets, but I really don't know what to do with them. I'm just gonna, you know, I can't use them. So this happens all the time and I have a hard time saying no to beautiful things that people want to give me. And I'm like Donna, thinking about ways where I can like, oh, take this and then pass it along to somebody who can actually really use it. Mm -hmm. So I had all these beautiful fabric stashes that dear friends of mine have passed to me. And I thought, you know, I don't know what to do. So sure enough, here is Catherine. She comes marching into my life. And she's got a store that sells that. Old blankets, fabrics, yeah, you know, fabric stashes that every quilter in America has way more fabric than they're ever gonna use. Right. I mean, like we have enough fabric in those boxes in grandma's attic to serve all of us for the next hundred years, probably. So there it is she takes donations and she turns around and sells fabric everything in her fabric store is four dollars a yard and it's all you know beautiful vintage old cool i mean some of it's nice. you know, bathing suit material that's not beautiful and old but it's super super functional and so she has this that's just a really good depiction of what abundance means to me like there is so much value in all that we already have right like we think oh maybe not this crowd and i think everybody in your um circle down it is probably pretty aware that they have choices to make and like they're thinking more about like what happens to the things they throw away but in the rest of the world it's very commonplace for people to feel like oh this shirt's outdated or it's not the right color for me or oh i got a little stain on it i gotta throw it away and, or, you know, grandma's fabric stash, what am I gonna do with it? I'm gonna take it to the dump. No, you're gonna give it to Catherine and she's gonna sell it in her store. And her whole idea is to put Joanne's out of business, Joanne Fabrics, because there's that much fabric out there. 
there's so much value that is gone like people don't see it right they move past it they want to go buy more fabric and right. so you know it's it's there and it's the same thing with the fabrics that i use for my product like there's so much fabric waste in the world that is actually like we could mine all that value we could mine it and turn it into things that are useful and really reduce the need to produce so much new this is so beautiful and for all you eco entrepreneurs out there or people who are tired of the corporate world and ready to shut down the negativity that's trying to fill your so heart and soul with beauty you've got many ideas here just right here from Crispina, um, uh, this is really uh, awesome. I love I love everything you just said there, and um, I I was thinking while you were saying how you know the they we're labeling things now you know non GMO and all of these things. Wouldn't it be amazing if people in the manufacturing business were it was mandatory to put a tag that this article of clothing was made in a sweat sweat lodge by a child yeah um uh, think about it before you yeah. throw it out or or you know whatever just we how 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 we can educate uh people and i hope your friend who's doing this um clothing business taking these fabrics and selling them for four dollars a yard which is beautiful um if she's educating people um, hopefully there's big signs in there and there's information. I know when we had my restaurant, I mean, I had table tents on there with all the statistics of how much food waste there was, how much, um, how many coffee cups for filling landfills. I mean, I just put it out there. I just like right there. And this is in the eighties. I mean, no mercy, no mercy here. If you were, you know, if you don't want to eat here and you know this stuff, you know, come back next time with your, with your coffee cup and I'll fill it and you'll take 50 cents off. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to shift people's mindset, this abundance mindset or, or, or just a mindset of, of being givers and not takers. And by also, um, creating something and educating people that's going to help future generations live on a planet where we can breathe clean air and drink potable water in business as we've said in so many of my episodes has changed the world faster than anything since the ice age and it's ethical businesses and business leaders with the moral courage that have the ability and responsibility to change things fastest and i just want to remind everybody who's listening right now it's your business what you do with your life and it's your business whether you buy upcycle clothing, start an upcycle business, or you're one of those people who takes a shirt with a stain on it and dumps it. We have choices to make and we got to make them fast because we all see what's happening with the heat waves around the world today. And we know that the textile company, Crispina just told us, and I can verify that, you just have to Google it, is next to gas and oil, the most toxic industry out there. And we all wear clothes. Yes. Okay. So true. Born, born with them, born, wrapped and born, born with them, ra wrapped around us when we're born and wrapped around when we go most of the time wrapped around. Them. So, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, the, redefining what abundance is, right? Redefining what the success and wealth is, redefining what um, it really means to be a conscious consumer or a citizen of this planet. I love your language in Crispina. I'm loving everything that you're bringing to this conver conversation and your entrepreneurial energy and just starting at such an, a young age. Cause a lot of my, the listeners on the show are, are, are in their twenties and thirties and looking to transition. And I think you and I are going to be doing something together in the near future, inspiring these young people to, um, bust out of these old belief systems, right? And into a, a more of a, I call it an entrepreneurial surge, right? Yeah. Um, I think entrepreneurs have the ability to really change the world. I feel absolutely. like it's their sacred duty, actually. Absolutely. I, I can't agree with you more. Yeah. So great. And it is, and you know what they have. I mean, when, I mean, as much as we might not like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or, um, Jeff Benzos, they're entrepreneurs, right? And they just did, went and took it to a, a, an extreme, but they're, 
there's uh, lots of incredible, and I, I just said a bunch of male entrepreneurs. I should talk about the female ones too, but right now um, I don't want to go down that hole. What I want to talk about really with you is um, where do you hope to be really in your life work in the next two years? Like where, where are you taking all this? Cause you know, you, even though you're 10 years younger than me, right? Um, like same thing with me, people are saying, why do you keep going, right? So wh where, where are you going now with this? And where do you see yourself in, in the next two years with all this wisdom and, and creative talent that you have? Oh, thanks for asking that question. I love I love to kind of think about that. It's a question I often ask people when I'm interviewing them, and the opportunity to answer it is um, is fresh for me. So thanks. Um, so it turns out that my life's work is really about connecting people and bringing them uh, all the things we talked about, really, right? Like, so the Stitcher Hood is kind of the place where people gather, and then this annual event that I will be hosting again in April, just before Earth Day, the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Summit, to, you know, to host that, to shine light on people who are doing good work in the world. And, the textile arena, um, you know, upcycling, recycling, reuse, you know, sustainability. There's, there's, you know, there's so many different facets of ways to be thoughtful about our consumption. Um, I would like to incorporate all of those specific to textiles. Um, and then I just, I launched a podcast recently, which just actually came out of preparing for the summit over, you know, the last... I, the summit was in April and for six months prior to the summit I did deep dive research into who was out there who is out there doing cool stuff in this field um, I've been kind of on the DL for the last 10 years really kind of living in a rural place and not really participating on the world stage as I had been prior so I really wanted to know like who who's out there making changes and it gave me this opportunity to interview people I interviewed 57 people and 20 of them were chosen to join me at the um, at the summit and that was just because of the time limitation that we had and it was the first time I ever ran a summit and Donna I don't know if you're like me with us but I'm like let's have a summit and then I looked at my assistant Iris I said how do you do that how do you have a summit what do I got to do how do you make that happen so we, or, you know, figured it out because that's just what we do. But um, now I'm aware that there's like, you know, we've done it once and so now it's going to be much easier to um, yeah. a second time. But um, so all of those interviews I conducted with all of those amazing people kind of didn't, I didn't think of the podcast in time to like harvest all that beauty and be able to promote it in a way where people could be, you know, have access to it. So as I start preparing for my next summit, I'm, I'm doing the same thing again. I'm interviewing all these amazing, change-making, awesome people from around the world. And, you know, there's they fit into the summit for different reasons, but all of them have something beautiful to share. So that's kind of how the um, podcast came about. And I am actually just really loving it. I'm loving the ability to change gears and to use the 30 plus years I have experience in this arena to help people not make those mistakes that I made and to just have it be a little easier for them and to have and not not to say that I made a lot of mistakes but you know it's you don't have to reinvent the wheel it's like right, absolutely. there's wheels out there and I got one <laughs> it has yeah. to do with textile upcycling so yeah I just want to share that you know what is so cool is you were both i'm doing my the same thing more in the food thing because i was in the restaurant business for all those years and national company food food everything food food disorder and uh food bring can bring order when you're hangry but um yeah and i just love that and i just i'm so excited to uh, you know off script off this podcast just talk about that because yeah there are shortcuts and that's why you guys i wrote this book and it tells you that and that's why you you wrote your book too and that's why there's there's these uh i don't want to say it's seniors out there are people out there that we do want to help make it a better world we want to help make your life easier and better and more joyful 
we in, inspiring you to be citizens and and conscious consumers whether it's in the textile business to the food business to the boating business whatever it is that you love there's ways to do things that are socially and environmentally responsible well, there's ways yeah. that we can be take a humanitarian approach and take it a next step further and beyond human humanitarian but also to look take into consider all of life kind as humanitarians sometimes we look at just the humans but our four-legged friends and those without legs at all those animal species that um like the, the silkworm for instance get bringing it back to textile i mean who takes the time to honor the silkworm right the cotton picker right yeah right. there's so much it's there's it's there's such a it, it really i think there's food and there's textiles right and there's building like you mentioned in that first part where you introduced with the chapter and i feel like one of the things that we can really kind of hone in on is what do we actually need? Yeah. And you know, I'm working. In, I work in the fashion industry. No, if, mm, I, I'm. Kind, I work in the fashion industry, but I also kind of like am the antithesis of the fashion industry, right? So like, I have a. I, I make clothing. It's handmade, one of a kind, like made with these hands. So it's not really the industry that I work in, but I I sell to the customer looking for that. So there's there's power in that right and yeah. it's like you can you can you know i for a long time i worked much more closely to the fashion industry and i sold at all the trade shows where you know people who guessed jeans was selling and le whatever the big brands that you know and people would always say to me well, what are you going to do for next season and i'd be like well i'll have a different tractor trailer load full of used clothing that i'll make into new clothing and it'll be yeah. different because it'll be different and like they couldn't they, they, you know, they're wrapping their head around the process, the difference in the process, the intrinsic differences that happen when you're being mindful versus when you're just going status quo. It's pretty normal. Being mind, mindless or mindful. Right. Right? Mindless is less negative. There's nothing positivity about being mindless. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I just have loved this conversation with you so, so much. And when um, you get closer to doing your summit, we welcome you. And like everybody who has listening to this, when you have something beautiful to share that's going to uplift people, um, please put it in our Facebook group um, and put the summit in there. Let people know when it is long beforehand and, um, and just Every, anybody who's doing anything positive that's helping to make the world a more humane place to be for all of life kind. We really appreciate that. And Crispina, we just have a few minutes left before we go off. And then anybody who wants to stay on and um, Crispina, you know, because this is going to be on YouTube and podcast, but your little dolls are back there are talking to me. And I know if you're listening to the podcast, they won't be able to see them, but bring them all forward. Look at these. And how <laughs> does this one have a name? Well, they're all called ragamuffins, and there's like three different styles. So there's this is called the pot belly, and this yeah. one's kind of like you, you, you can get them to sit down. This yeah, this oh. the most popular style. Yeah, and it, you know, the, they all have tails. And then this one, it's kind of a, it's just called a stand up ragamuffin because, and it doesn't actually stand up; it just looks like it should. Or <laughs> you know, it should be actually called like the dancer because it really does look like it's doing it. Oh, God, thing. it's so cute. And then this is the dinosaur. This was the first one that I started with. But, you know, I have, I'm working on this project. I'd love to share if it's okay. Yes. Oh, please share it. Yes. So one of the things that I've been doing, and actually it started in the middle, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, um, I had um, my people, my, my members and my membership were really distraught like the rest of us. And I thought we got to do something together. So I, I just pulled out of my thoughts. I'm like, I know what we could do let's make a blanket together and I, I sold kits and everybody stitched a square and they made um, I'm just looking I actually have a square let me just grab it for you um, everybody made a square this was the first from the first stitch along and it's like it's wool Beautiful. and it's like wool applique and then everybody Funny. sent me back their squares and I sewed them into a blanket that we sold through like a, an auction setting like it was like an eBay thing um, we used eBay like embedded in my website and 
All the proceeds went to support the women's shelter um, for survivors of domestic violence that was local to me. And we raised like a thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. then I thought when that one was over, people were like, what's next? So I thought, let's do another stitch along. We'll just do them like as we can. You know, it's not a huge time commitment. It's kind of fun. It's, it's really cool. It brings people together. So then the second one, we did squares that looked like this. This was um, like oh. lots of wool, a little bit lighter weight um, with the leaf motif. And um, again, we picked somebody who was participating. We um, asked everybody to recommend a not-for-profit to support. And we chose another um, place for survivors of domestic violence. Um, there was a big uptick in um, domestic violence calls during the pandemic. So that was where the inspiration for that came from. And again, we raised the next second one we raised $1,600 with and we changed the way people could donate. So rather than having to purchase it as um, like an auction setting, they could just um, donate $20 to get the chance to win the blanket. So then at the, um, at the summit in April, I had the pure joy and pleasure of connecting with the G's Bend quilters. And if you're familiar with quilting in the United States, G's Bend is very notable. It's a place, it's actually a town, a little tiny town with 200 people that's located in um, a G's Bend, Alabama. And um, the descendants of slaves live in this town and they make the most unbelievably beautiful quilts none none of the corners match everything is kind of wonky and phenomenal and the first time i ever saw g's bend quilts i was um in new york city at the whitney museum this was 20 years ago and i just was completely like dumbfounded like it was one of the only times i can ever remember having no words just like oh, oh my gosh yeah so I got to Mary Margaret Petway, who is one of the G's Ben quilters, was um, one of our presenters at the summit. And we, we became friends um, through that process. And she told me that she would really love to have a quilting studio. And I said, Mary Margaret, there are G's Ben quilts in 25 museums all over the world. And the fact that you don't have a quilting studio makes my heart hurt. I'm like, that should not be. Like, you need a quilting studio. Let's do a stitch along. So we're doing a stitch along. It's actually right now is a time where people can register. This is our square and it's actually made out of linen and cotton. And she will be making a quilt from this. So um, you can purchase, a, um, you know, you can register for the, the, the participating in the stitch along and um, you can either purchase a kit or just have, you know, attend the, um, the classes. It's a four hour commitment and everybody makes a square and sends them off to um, have them be part of the quilt that will then be a fundraiser to support the construction of a quilting studio in G's Bend. So. Uh, that is so beautiful. My goosebumps are rising all over my body and just in closing, I mean, just how beautiful we had this conversation one stitch at a time, one a consumer turn to citizen at a time, one business at a time, one entrepreneurial idea at a time can not only serve and make the earth healthier, humanity better, but can build a studio for this beautiful woman who's we're building her a studio. I mean, business is a force for change as a when it's used as a force for change, for a force for good. Uh, Crispina French, it has been an honor and a joy and a privilege to have you on. And we'll have to have you um, back on again. And you'll, you'll tell us, give us some progress of how that quilting, um, uh, the outcome, please put this in our Facebook group. Um, oh, I'm will. sure there's people in there who would probably love one. And you could even pop in a little video just like you just did at the little ending there. And I just want to thank all of you guys who came on live today. Crispina, I think that wraps it up. That was a beautiful ending. Um, there's a few little comments in here uh, connecting the dots, just one stitch at a time, right? Um, we really, really appreciate um, you and everything that you're, you're you're doing and bringing to the world. And again, uh -huh. everybody who came on to a, uh, another episode of A Dose of Positivity, many, many blessings. You're awesome. Next week, we have Dominique Dom, his short for Dominique Dom coming on. And he is a podcaster too, like you and me or whatever. I'm, I'm a broadcaster. My show is a live broadcast, A Dose of Positivity. <laughs> um, and he interviewed 
interviews authors so who are doing good things in the world that's what he does and he is a beautiful beautiful man so i hope you'll all join us um and if you are an author or you know somebody who's an author you might want to invite them to come to this call because he's always looking for change makers and innovators um who are or authors and he's going to be talking to about us what it means to the written word right and how powerful it can be to make um to change to change the world for the better so um without further ado do we're gonna go off live you guys will see you next week and remember have a blessed day and spread your love far and wide aloha thank you so much thank you you're so welcome